Right. We're back on air. Back on air and very happy to welcome you all to episode 12 of Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. Before we induct another cricketer into the Once Ashes Hall of Fame, just a reminder of the bonus material and clips that can be found on the Once Upon a Time in the Ashes YouTube channel and on the website onceuponatimeintheashes.com. I've recently added some clips of Neil Harvey talking about the famous Invincibles tour of England in 1948, kippers for breakfast at the Queen's Hotel in Leeds, and that magnificent century on his Ashes debut, aged only 19. They are certainly worth a few minutes of your time. But back to business. You might remember that we are in the decade of punk, prog and platform shoes, 1977 to be specific, and the Ashes series of that year in England is bookended by our latest One Ashes Test Wonders. Last time around, we heard from Graham Barlow of Middlesex, now in Noosa, Australia, who played in the opening test of the series at his home ground of Lords. And Mick Malone took his bow for the final test of the series at the Oval. He is the only Australian on our list to take a five-wicket haul in his one and only Ashes test, taking five for 63 in the first innings as Australia bowled England out for 214. What did Mick Skipper make of this masterclass? Here's Greg Chappell. Conditions in England were probably ideal for Mick. It wasn't your standard oval pitch. Uh, normally at the oval, by the end of the summer, it's dry. And from recollection, it had been a reasonably wet summer. Mick bowled beautifully. Uh, he was a tall right arm seamer. Conditions were good. The thing with Mick was you could put him on at one end and forget about him. He could bowl all day if you needed him to. Incredibly uh, fit, incredibly strong and just loved bowling, and he just bowled a great line and a great length for England. Probably in Australia, he wasn't the ideal bowler in certain conditions, like in Perth, into the wind, he was a very good bowler. Mm. The Gabba, he probably, you know, he could have done well there. Probably the rest of the pitches in Australia at that stage weren't ideal for mixed type of bowling, but he could well have played a lot more test, test matches than he did. We'll hear Mick's take on his superb debut soon. But first, let's take a moment to remember another fast bowler who ended up on the west coast of Australia. Colin Guest, Australian test cricketer Double Nelson, 2-2-2, played his one and only test in the third match of the 1962-63 Ashes series at Sydney. 62-3 was his standout season. He took 39 Sheffield Shield wickets at 18.28, helping Victoria to win the Shield for the first time since... 1950-51. His performances were becoming hard to ignore for the national selectors. Career best figures of 7 for 95 against Western Australia and 4 for 34 against New South Wales, just ahead of the third test. And his victims that day certainly weren't bunnies. Bob Simpson, Norm O'Neill, Neil Harvey and Brian Booth. All while the New South Wales and Australia captain Richie Benno looked on from the dressing room. His call-up to the national side came after Australia had lost the second test of the series at Melbourne. Peter Burge and Ken Mackay made way for Barry Shepherd and Colin. Colin's job was to support the potent pace duo of Alan Davidson and Graham McKenzie. His test match, certainly with the ball, was not nearly as spectacular as his other performances that season. He bowled economically but wicketless in both innings, But he did put on a crucial partnership of 39 with Barry Shepherd for the 10th wicket that gave Australia a first innings lead in a low scoring game. Australia went on to win the match by eight wickets after England had been blown away by Davidson and Mackenzie in the second innings. But Ken Mackay was recalled for the fourth test and that was that for Collins' test cricket career. Colin played grade cricket for Melbourne during his time at Victoria And then in 1965, he moved to Western Australia, appearing in seven Shield games for WA and playing his club cricket at Nedlands. Ted Wishart was his teammate and future captain at Nedlands, and Colin reminded Ted of another Western Australian all-round sportsman, Keith Slater, 
who was our guest on the very first episode of this podcast. He and Colin both played first-class cricket and first-class baseball, and that was why they were such good fieldsmen with rocket arms. Ken Millman would have been captain when he first came. I, I was his captain for about four seasons. He was one of the people that Ken Millman got from Victoria, and he also played in the uh, first match Australia played after the war in 1945-6 against New Zealand. Ken Millman played in that game and he was a fantastic coach. And when he first came, he was about number nine or ten, but he worked hard with Ken Millman and within a season he'd got him up to number five. We got him up to number five. I haven't seen a player hit the ball harder than Colin Guest used to. One spectacular innings I'll never, ever forget was uh, against Claremont at Claremont Oval. And in those days, club cricket and league football was played on the same oval. And we got there for the game and the, uh, the goalposts were still up from the football season. Colin loved hitting sixes. He said, oh, he said, I'm going to hit a heap of sixes today. And he did. He hit six sixes in three overs uh, before he holed out. He made round about 60. But I've never seen hitting like it. He was hitting them through the goalposts, which were about 10 metres further on from the end of the field. Just absolutely spectacular. I've never seen anything to equal it. Fantastic bloke. He was as good a club man as you could wish to get. He just lived for sport. Thanks very much to Ted for sharing those memories of Colin. Colin passed away in December 2018, aged 81. And now it's time to leave Netherlands behind and take a short drive up the coast to Scarborough to check in with Mick Malone. Mick Malone was a right-arm swing bowler for Scarborough, Western Australia, Lancashire and Australia. He also played Aussie rules football for Subiaco. In 73 first-class games between 1975 and 1982, Mick took 260 wickets at 24.77. He played his one Ashes test at the Oval in 1977, taking six wickets and making his highest first-class score of 46, which makes his test match average 46 with a bat and 12.83 with a ball. Mick. Welcome to Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. Thank you, Graham. It's my privilege. (laughs) With those stats, I'm thinking you maybe should have played more test cricket for Australia. Well, maybe so. I'm not too sure about that. It was interesting for a while after those stats were made, the the quiz nights, which I know, of course, you run in England as well. One of the quiz nights was which West Australian has the best betting average and bowling average of any other West Australian in test cricket. And it was me for both. (laughs) <laughs> and since then, certainly, uh, I think Justin Langer and Adam Gilchrist have gone past me in the batting, but yeah, it was quite a freakish game. Well, listen, we'll get to the Ashes test and we'll get to World Series cricket and all the other brilliant things you did. But let's start at the beginning, if you don't mind. You were born in Scarborough. What was it like growing up there? Well, it was pretty humble surroundings in Scarborough. It wasn't a wealthy area at all, but of course, they were sports mad and we were by the beach. So the beach was a big factor in our lives. As much as I love the beach, I love cricket and football more. So uh, cricket certainly uh, took over for me. How did you get into cricket as a young lad? Where did you first start playing? Well, I played, I think it was an under under 14 level. And my father always encouraged me to be in cricket. I loved every minute of it. I followed the cricket very much on the radio and the Australian England test matches in those days. And with Freddie Truman and Brian Statham, And of course, people like uh, Richie Benno, Bill Lurie, Alan Davidson, they were all boyhood heroes of mine. And we had the backyard test matches and the test matches on the road in front of our houses. There was only ever England and Australia. So as you're growing up, so into your teens then, as I said in the intro, you're a big Aussie rules player as well. Did you have to manage the two sports and how difficult was that? Well, these days it's impossible. But in my day, a lot of people did it. And I guess no different than uh, Dennis Compton who played soccer and 
and cricket and Ian Botham, and I'm sure you would have a host of others who did that. In my day, it was quite common, and you mentioned Keith Slater already who did it, and I would suggest a more prominent Aussie rules player than he was a cricketer. He also played for Western Australia, and yeah, he course. was certainly uh, you know, a very, very good player. Although uh, there wasn't dozens of people who did it, perhaps some people who, who you would certainly know, Australian cricketers, were Keith Miller, who did it for a, a period of time, Max Walker, was an Aussie rules player and a footballer. So it wasn't an uncommon thing. And in those days, because the seasons were pretty well defined, it was quite different. Did you have a preference? Uh, did you prefer one sport or the other? Or did you like playing both? I love them both. But Aussie rules is a pretty vigorous and rough game. Playing on a wintry day when you're likely to get a, a belt around the head or get whacked and so forth versus playing on a beautiful English cricket ground, uh, there's no choice. Cricket was always <laughs> the number one. So what about playing cricket for, for Scarborough then? I guess Scarborough was the first experience of grade cricket that you had? Yes, we had a very good team in, in my younger days. In fact, I think at one stage we had something like five test or ex-test players in our A-grade side, which was pretty good. We had you know Rod Marsh, myself, a fellow called Sam Gannon, Trevor Chappell who played, Tom Hogan. The Scarborough Cricket Club was uh, where I spent most of my life. We had a wicket that was very conducive to my sort of bowling and conditions very favourable, a bit like the Wacker ground. And Perth is like that. You know, it, it really does suit swing bowling and a lot of the grounds were very similar. Now, wickets were always green and hard and so they bounced. And with the Fremantle Doctor, you had the, the breeze in which you could always manipulate the ball to swing it as much as you like. How did you develop swing bowling? Because obviously it's quite an art. Who, who taught you the, the rudiments of that? Probably people that, that really... Counted Ian Brayshaw was very helpful to me once I made the Sheffield Shield team. But prior to that, I had a fellow called Colin Guest, who I think is also a one-test player yeah. for uh, Australia. And he was a coach down at Scarborough in my younger days. And he was a good swing bowler who'd come from Victoria to play in Western Australia. And he was one that uh, assisted me greatly. But I read a lot of books. Don Bradman, you might remember The Art of Cricket and a few old-fashioned books like that, and I, I devoured them. It was probably a bit self-taught, and I used to uh, get a tennis ball and put sticky tape on one half, and all. <laughs> swing bowling fascinated me. Then you mentioned the step up then to Sheffield Shield cricket. When you were playing for Scarborough, was that a, a realistic dream for you? I was something like 24, I think, before I made my debut, and it was beyond my wildest dreams. I absolutely never thought it would happen. I was a reasonably prominent Australian rules footballer at that time, and that was my main sport, but certainly not my first love. But I never, ever thought that I had the ability or was any possibility, and then I got picked to play in some Colts games for Western Australia, did pretty well, and all of a sudden I was in the Shield side. And I know that the selectors there who were, who I became very friendly with afterwards said to me, it was because I swung the ball so prodigiously is what attracted their attention to me. And I, I guess that's what held me through my whole career. For a couple of years there in the Shield side, John Everly was my first captain, but Rod Marsh captained us to a couple of uh, successful Shield finals. Rod used to say that I was the perfect foil for the man at the other end, who was Dennis Lilly. And Dennis had come in with these Thunderbolts and I'd come in with these big, hooping, gentle in-swingers and out-swingers, and the batsmen were pretty keen to see me and took risks that they'd never take. Rod used to say that we were the ideal combination. Do you remember your debut or your first couple of matches for, for WA? Yes, I do. I played a, a one-day game, which was actually a final in what they called the Gillette Cup. And believe it or not, we played New Zealand at the MCG, and I don't know why that happened. We were bowled out for 78 and they got the runs in oh, 20 overs. I got, uh, I think, one wicket and got a few runs. And I thought, well, that'll be it. it great fun. And all of a sudden, uh, I got picked for the next Shield game. I think it was the end of the season and we played two games and I took five wickets in one and a few in another. But I got a couple of good players out. I got Dougie Wallers out twice for New South Wales. And so, you know, through big hooping outswingers. You know, luckily enough, they kept on picking me. Well, it was a brilliant start to your Sheffield Shield career, wasn't it? Because you ended up winning the title that year. Yes, we did. We had a star-studded side. Lily Marsh and in Verity, Ross Edwards, Ian Brayshaw, you know, Bruce Led. there's uh, Kim Hughes. There was an awful lot of good players there. Mm. 
Yeah, so that was a great introduction to Shield cricket, and it just continued, didn't it, really? As you said, Western Australia had such a strong side at that point. You had two superb seasons following that debut season, didn't you? Yeah, I did, and I can't uh, probably emphasise the uh, probably the advantage I had with having someone like Dennis Hill at the other <laughs> end. The world's greatest ever fast bowler in that period of time, and it was just such a massive advantage I do think uh, he contributed to a lot of my wickets in that they really took risks against me that they'd probably never normally take against a normal bowler yeah. because he had them tied up. But just looking through the stats, 75-6, you actually had a better average than Lily and Thompson. You took your 28 wickets at 18, <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, yeah. What do they say? Figures don't lie, but maybe yeah. they do there. It just all fell into place for me. 76-77 looks like your best season ever. Absolutely. I had a great year that year. Uh, sometimes you're at the peak of your career, and, and that was me. And we had a good slips, Corden. Rod Marsh was captain at that time, and, and Rod encouraged me by, and I'm pretty sure that I probably bowled more overs than any other player in Shield cricket, or at least the mm. equal of. And he had a lot of confidence in me. I always used a new ball. And I've got to say, playing a lot of games at the Wacker was also a huge advantage because mm. uh, it was very conducive to swing bowling. And I guess once you get on a roll, do you think it's just that your technique is improving and you're becoming a better bowler? Or is it the confidence that you gain? You just go on the pitch thinking, oh, I'm going to take a few wickets today. Well, I'm sure it's the confidence, maybe, but too, when you're taking wickets, um, you get a bit of a reputation for someone who's bowling pretty well and the batsmen see you as maybe a better bowler than you were. All sorts of things fell into place. I think it was part of being a very strong team. It was just, yeah, perhaps that, that was my peak. Well, we'll get to, we're going to come on to 77, obviously, the, the Ashes Tour and your Ashes appearance in yep. second. But actually, just before we get to that, the Gillette Cup final, you made a huge contribution with the bat, didn't you? You made 47 not out. Tell us about that Gillette Cup final, because it seemed like a fantastic match. We bowled Victoria about for, I think, about 160 or 70, and we thought that was reasonable. And all of a sudden, we're seven for 90. And I still remember Dennis, was, Lily, was to go in front of me and... I'd played a couple of good innings for Western Australia prior to that. And Rod stopped him as he went to go out the door. He said, no, I'm putting Mick in in front of you. And Dennis wasn't happy about this. So out I went and uh, we were knocking the ball around myself and Craig Sargent. Sargent got out and Dennis came in to join me. And I could tell he was a bit miffed. And I ran him out within about two deliveries. And he was <laughs> absolutely filthy on me. But then Wayne Clark came in and we just hung in there and... It was quite an incredible game. There was 33,000 people there, which at that stage, I think a world record for a one-day game at the MCG or anywhere, but it was played at the MCG. And we needed uh, five to win off the last over. And I remember uh, a bloke called Trevor Lachlan was bowling and I ran down the wicket, I think on the first ball, and I French cut him for four. <laughs> so we, we only need one now to win. And I ran down the wicket on the second ball and French cut him for another four. It was quite remarkable. But what yeah. I do recall, we were gone for all money at seven for 90. And with the 33,000 people there, there was this incredible hush from the opposition supporters who just couldn't believe that they'd lost. Yeah. But it was a great victory for us and uh, it was, was my day in the sun for sure. Yeah, what a day. Brilliant. OK, so that was a superb season. There was... The Pakistan series, wasn't it, in Australia? And then there was yes. a tour to New Zealand. Did you ever feel like you could be in the frame for those two? No, not really. And it wasn't probably towards the end of the season that I thought I was a real chance for England, which I did think I was a real chance. But I probably wouldn't have gone had Dennis Lilly not made himself unavailable for the series, mm. which he did just prior to the uh, tour being selected. Mm. Because Jeff Thompson was in it. Uh, Lenny Pascoe, who was a certainty, Max Walker was the other quickie. Dennis would have been the fourth, but Dennis pulled out and hence I got an opportunity. But they must have also been thinking, well, swing bowling, English conditions, you know, this is a guy we've got to take. Well, I'm, I'm sure they did because the Bob Massey thing of 72 with his 16 wickets and we're yeah. from the same state. I can recall reading a lot of the media in those days. They talked about, will this be the new Bob Massey and all this sort of business? It didn't quite work out as good as that, but certainly they could see that that sort of bowling would perhaps suit the English conditions. So we've got this Ashes tour that you're then selected for. 
What then confuses matters here is <laughs> World Series cricket comes along. I mean, who made the approach to you? And was it sometime during that season or just before you went on the tour? It was possibly uh, I had been selected for England two or three weeks before we went to England. And I was approached by a man called Austin Robertson, who was the fellow who did all that. By coincidence, Austin Robertson and I played football at Subiaco. He was a legendary player for Subiaco, one of the greatest of all time. So he and I knew each other extremely well. So he asked to see me at a, I think at the Sheraton Hotel, and we were sworn on secrecy. And he told me that this was happening. And he said, the following people have signed, Dennis Lilly, I think Greg Chappell, Ian Chappell, and a number of others. Now, at that point, I didn't really think I was a frontline test player. And the money, which was nothing today, but in those days very significant, was important. And more so was the fact that when he told me who had signed, I thought, how can I not be involved in this? Mm. Even though I understood there was a risk and so forth. But I thought, given that I was a borderline player, I always saw myself as a borderline player. I was happy to take the risk. Obviously, this had been brewing for a while. I spoke to Fred Rumsey as part of this series, and he set up the Professional Cricketers Association in England, which pushed for better conditions for players and more money. You know, and that was the late 60s. So it took a time for, for this to come into effect. What were your circumstances? Were you working at the same time as playing cricket? Yeah, I was a school teacher. And I recall that just in rough terms, when the approach was made, and I think I was offered 19000 or something like that for a three-month period, plus bonuses and this and that and the other thing. And I think it worked out to about I would get something like three years school teacher's salary to play three months of cricket, yeah. which today would be nothing in comparison. Hmm. But in those days, when you were getting nothing for playing cricket anyway virtually, yeah. It all sounded pretty good. So I, you know, I, I was keen to go. But look, I, I would have played cricket for nothing anyway. That's yeah. just the way I felt about it. Mm. And this was just a bonus. Do you think the World Series cricket was necessary to take the game forward? Graham, I think people like Ian Chappell, Greg Chappell, Dennis Lilly, Rod Marsh, these players that really put their creating lives on the line for the betterment of the game. I didn't. I was just superfluous to that. I was, you know, one of the borderline players, but they were incredibly brave to do that because they saw a need to do it. Am I right in saying 13 of the 17-man squad were signed up for World Series Correct. cricket? So that obviously meant four weren't. Did that make life difficult with those four? Well, they didn't know about it for the first two months of the tour because <laughs> nothing was said. We were absolutely sworn to secrecy and that's the way it was. And when it broke, which was about, I think, a month or two into the tour, then the four players, and Craig Sargent, Gary Cozier, Kim Hughes and Jeff Dimmick, knew all about it. And really, no, I, I don't think it did make a big difference between all of us. Uh, perhaps some people said it was an excuse afterwards, but there didn't seem to be too much animosity in the whole situation. The press felt it, it did cause our poor performances, mm -hmm. and it was a very poor tour for Australia, that tour of 77, and maybe that was a factor. I'm not sure about that. Well, let's look, go back to the cricket because I know you only played in that one Ashes test, but obviously yep. the tours were a lot longer there. You played a lot of cricket that summer, didn't you? I think you played about 14 games on, on top of your test match. And you took a wicket with your first ball in England. Is that right? Uh, oh, yeah, I think that was at uh, Arundel Castle, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a full toss caught and bowled. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Barkley <laughs> caught and bowled is what I saw in the record books. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Playing the Duchess of Norfolk's Invitational Eleven. So they. Yeah. Well, what a beautiful way to start a, a cricket tour. Brilliant. Yeah. And what were some of the highlights of the other matches you played against the county sides? Do you remember much of those games? It's a bit of a blur and mm -hmm. I can't recall a lot of that, but I had two or three good games. I think I, I had a good game against Yorkshire in Scar at Scarborough. My performance during the tour was probably oh, mediocre. I, I didn't shine out too often and uh, you know in the end I thought I was pretty lucky to get a, a game in the fifth test match and I I think I almost got that only because Len Pascoe was injured. I certainly didn't play brilliantly through the tour. 
Well, I think you're doing yourself a slight disservice because I'll just give you a list of names of some of the players you did get out during those games. Oh, OK. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of English captains, present, past or future. So you've got Brian Close out, obviously during that Yorkshire match. You've got John Embury yep. out, David Graveney, Viv Richards when you were playing Somerset. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> David Lloyd, Mike Brearley, England captain, Tony Gregg and Clive Rice. So... That's oh, a bad oh, list of players. <laughs> no, well, can I rethink that previous comment? Yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> of course, David Lloyd, I ended up, he was my roommate when I played with Lancashire. So right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. What about, let's, let's jump to the Oval then, because that's, that's when you did make your appearance. Unfortunately for Australia, the Ashes were gone by that point. But when did you find out you were going to play and um, what were your feelings when you heard that? Now, I, I can't recall whether it's the day before or the morning of the game, but Greg Chappell came to me and said, well, first of all, he said, you're in the the 14, I think, or 13 that we'll select from. And Lem Pascoe was in it as well. And I didn't, ex- in, I didn't think I'd be selected. And then he said, you're in. And I, to this day, I'm very grateful to Greg because I felt that he actually gave myself and Kim Hughes, who hadn't played a test match either, a game in a test series that was lost anyway. And I think he almost did that out of the goodness of his heart. And I'm not too sure how injured Len was, but I was beside myself because I, I never thought that would happen. I thought this is my one tour in my life. I'll never do it again. And it hasn't been wonderfully successful, but I've had a great time. And all of a sudden I'm in the test side. I guess you were pretty nervous that first day, but then it was completely rained off, wasn't it, the first day? Yes, it was. So you finally got the ball in hand on day two. And as I said at the, in, in the intro, you had a... A sparkling match, didn't you, with ball and bat? But tell us about your bowling to start with. Well, uh, conditions were good, you know, overcast, and uh, I swung the ball about quite a bit. I think I'd bowled something like 20 overs before I took a wicket. And at that point, by about the 18th to the 19th over, I thought, well, I'm going to get taken off shortly. I've had a test match. I haven't got a wicket. Didn't even think about getting a run. What an experience. And... uh, I did feel I'm out of my depth here. These fellows are just too good. I'm not going to get a wicket. And all of a sudden, bang, something happens. I'll get a wicket and then another and then another. But the interesting thing is, Graham, I've, I've never seen it before on uh, any vision. And I've tried to Google it many times in the last 30 or 40 years. And it was only six months ago. And I, it may be recently that it's just been uh, posted somewhere that it's actually there, and I saw it for the first time. It brought back a lot of memories. It was fabulous. But, yeah, Greg Chappell just had confidence in me and just left me on, and I I wasn't costing him any runs because, uh, you know, I was very economical, obviously, with the figures. Every time someone nicked it, someone caught it, it was fantastic. Well, I think Mike Brearley, the England captain, was your first wicket, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout your career, your economy rate was superb, wasn't it? And in that match... Just to reiterate your figures, five for 63 in the first innings off 47 overs. So um, that's pretty tight going, isn't it? (laughs) And you took the wickets of Derek Randall, Tony Gregg, Alan Knott and John Lever. A few good good ones in there. Absolutely. A few good ones in there, yeah. But then you decided to throw the bat around a little bit as well. Tell us about that, because that ended up as your, as I said at the start, your highest first class score. Yeah, well, I came in at number 10. Mike Hendrick was bowling, and uh, I think I played a miss at the first two, and then Nick, the next one straight to Tony Gregg at second slip. Now, Tony hadn't dropped a catch all year, all tour, and he put it down. And he turned to me and he said, how can you bat before Jeff Thompson? Because Tomo was number 11. And I was thinking, I tend to agree with you. How, how can I? And from then on, it started to hit the middle of the bat. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm 46 runs, and... Uh, Again, I saw this on YouTube the other day, and I don't look like the most technically correct batsman, but I hit a few in the middle, and in fact, I hit Derek Underwood for two fours in a row, which wasn't a bad effort, I thought, yeah, myself. Yeah. But yeah, 46, and you know, I would have liked to have got 50, but pretty happy with the 46. Definitely, yeah. No French cuts that day. No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned Greg Chappell as well. I mean, um, I've had the privilege to speak to him for, for this series, and he is great company. What, what was he like as a skipper? Oh, Greg was terrific. He was such a great player and he led by example all the time. And he was a straight shooter, Greg. He he told you what he thought. 
you know, you were never left wondering what was going on. And, uh, and I thought Greg was very fair, but his main attribute was the fact that he, he was such a, an outstanding cricketer. You knew you could rely on him under all circumstances. He was terrific. Well, the game ended in a draw, so and a terrific match for you, but ended in a draw. What was the feeling like in the dressing room? That was the end of the tour. Was everyone a bit downcast with, with, uh, with the results? Yeah, I'm sure they were. And there was a lot of bad press on the tour because uh, I think the press felt the World Series cricket aspect had certainly made a difference to the way the, the team performed. You know, with a 3-0 result. Uh, was I think one of the worst tours Australia had for a, a lot of period of time. But we were all sort of wondering what was next and up in, you know, and with World Series cricket about to happen. And it was quite an indecisive sort of situation where I think people were a bit wary about what the next step was going to be. But what about from your perspective? Because as we said at the top of uh, this interview, you grew up playing matches in your backyard, uh, thinking that they were Ashes matches. What did it mean to you to, to play an Ashes match? Oh, look, I, I just couldn't believe it. And to have success that I did, it was just beyond my wildest imagination. And uh, I, I often have a bit of a, a joke with Kim Hughes, who we're great mates and I was best man for Kim's wedding and we made our debut together. And I often tell a story of how Kim made one I made 46 and took six wickets. We played 86 tests between us, but he played 85. So <laughs> it's it's not necessarily how you start, but it was an incredible debut and uh, just be beyond what I thought could possibly happen. But I still didn't have any r regrets about my next move. I, I still felt that things fell into place for me that day, but I didn't have the confidence to think I was a world beater at any stage. No, no. But I guess ordinarily with a match like that, you get the next match, don't you? I know it's the end of the tour, but you'd think you would get another go in the test side. Because you'd signed up for World Series cricket, were you thinking in your own head then, that's the last time I played for Australia? Or did you think there'd be more opportunities? No, absolutely. I thought that'd be the last time I'd play. And I do agree with you. I probably would have got the next test match, wherever that may, may have been. But I knew that wasn't to be. I thought, well, who knows how long World Series cricket would have gone for. We didn't know at that point. But I certainly thought that would be my one and only. OK, let's have a look at World Series cricket, if you don't mind. There were some fabulous matches and lineups. For example, the second test scorecard, 78 at Perth, where the World Eleven batted first, scored 625, the top ah. three. Gordon Greenwich, 140. Barry Richards, 207. Viv Richards, 177. Well, I mean, when you look at those players and, and the names involved, was mm. I mean, how are you going to beat uh, Gordon Greenwich, Barry Richards, Viv Richards? On yeah. the, what a combination. <laughs> That's just outrageous. Yeah. And there's no question that, you know, they, they were incredible times and the world's best cricketers were there and it was tough to get a run and take a wicket. Yeah, absolutely. Because you didn't actually play in those three tests, but you did come in to play in the International Cup, as they called it. Is that right? And how yes. was that? Yes. I Well, I, I loved every minute of it. I uh, had a very famous game, which you're probably going to bring up in a minute. Uh, <laughs> well, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing less. Well, um, no, the first but... one was, well, your debut, I think, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, was Adelaide, the December of that year, 77. Yes. When you took two for 12 off eight. Yeah, well, in those days, I used to bowl my 10 overs out. Right. And uh, they didn't really go for you at the start. Cricket has changed dramatically, and they were happy to sit on you for the first 10 overs. Mm -hmm. So I probably had some advantages there. And your two wickets that day, can you remember? Can't remember, no. Well, go the, on. the aforementioned Barry Richards, so oh, not too bad. Oh, oh, oh. And Bob Woolmer as well. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. yes. And then you did play at Perth in January 78 against the World Eleven. So was that quite a big moment for you to actually play in a big game in your home state? No question. Yep. Yeah, I loved every minute of that. And uh, I remember the crowd being very receptive to it too. Yeah, yeah. Go on then. I'm going to tell you who you got out that day. Barry Richards also. Oh! oh. <laughs> and I tell people I never got him out. Well, there yeah. you go. So uh, I, I, he was as good as I ever saw. And then the famous game, let's get on to that then. So <laughs> you know which one I'm talking about. So do you want to take yes, us through that match? Yeah. This was when we were playing 
the West Indies. I had the last over to bowl and I think they needed 11 to win. I do recall with two balls to go, they still needed, I think, six or five. And Wayne Daniel was on strike. And uh, I remember saying to Ian Chappell, uh, where do you think I should bowl? And he said, son, you, you're playing for Australia. You, uh, you should know. And then he sort of stopped. He said, look, just don't bowl anywhere near his legs. And in those days, you know, a leg side ball wasn't necessarily a wide. Well, uh, that's exactly where I bowled it, right near his legs. He took one step out to leg side and hit me 14 rows into the grandstand and they won the game. And I remember there was about 50,000 people, I think, or there was a big crowd at VFL Park because that's where it was played. And I remember they stood and booed me off the ground. So it was it was quite a night. <laughs> I mean, you played a lot of the one-day matches, as we said, but you did play in one of the super tests against the West Indies, 78-79. Yeah. That was and tough you... work. I might have got a wicket or two, but not, yeah. not too many. Yeah, you got one for 68 and two for 41, so you know, pretty good. But again, yeah. I think the calibre of the batsmen you get out is staggering because you've got like, Clive Lloyd and Viv Richards again there. Well, it's interesting. I used to get Clive Lloyd out a bit, I think, uh, from memory, and I know I got Viv out a few times, but... I, I honestly hadn't thought of that, but that's very, very nice to know. Did it mean as much to you to play in a World Series cricket super test as it did to play in the Ashes? Uh, I've never thought about that, but mm -hmm. you're the first person that's ever asked me that. And I would have to honestly say that the Ashes test was the one I cherish most. Be interesting to know about 79 now when you moved to England to play in the Lancashire League. I mean, the Lancashire League has come up a few times, actually, in these conversations. Keith Slater not only shares with you Aussie rules, but he also played Lancashire League for one season as well. Yeah, I, well, I went over there and played in 79 for Hazenden and I loved every minute of it. And of course, I, I followed, I think John Dyson was the previous uh, pro for Hazenden mm. and two or three years prior to that, or maybe a bit, bit earlier than that, was uh, Dennis Lilly, probably a few years earlier than that. Uh, and Clive Lloyd had also played for Hazenden. But I had a fabulous time there and uh, I, I thought that was a great competition and I still keep in touch with people from the Lancashire League. Did you ever go back in later years once you'd retired from cricket? On two or three occasions, yes, yeah. I did. Uh, always loved every minute of it. In fact, I, I recall going to a function there where I suggested that they pick their all-time best ever team over 100 years. And incidentally, I wasn't in it and I didn't expect yeah. to be. But we were doing that in Australia. We were picking teams, our best team for 100 years. And they had a big function there. And they, I remember them saying that this is Mick Malone's idea and what a great idea it was. And they, they had their all-time great team, which was fantastic. And then, of course, you, you got to play for Lancashire as well. First ball in English cricket, take a wicket, your first Ashes test, you have a brilliant match. And you went brilliantly in your first couple of matches for Lancashire, didn't you? Yeah, it, I came at the end of the 79 series. Uh, I had a freak run. I, in fact, I think I had my best ever figures in first-class cricket in those last three or four games. I had a dream run there. It, I didn't have the same success, some of it because I was injured the next year, but we, we had a very good team there at Lancashire. David Lloyd, uh, Paul Allen, Clive Lloyd was captain. You mm. know, there was a lot of very well-known cricketers in that team. Not a bad captain, yeah. No. <laughs> How did he compare to someone like Greg Chappell, you know, in terms of styles of captaincy? They were different. Clive was a legend in Lancashire, as, as everybody yeah. knows. And uh, even though he was getting towards the end of his career, you'd still watch him go out there and just uh, smash an attack to pieces. And yeah. he'd usually feel on the slips where he was brilliant. But when the pressure was on, he'd go into the covers and you saw the, the wonderful fieldsman that he was. And yeah. as a captain, he, he was great. Yeah, just look at some of your figures. Seven for 88. I don't know if that's the, the figures you're thinking about, but that was against yes, Knox it is. at Blackpool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At, at Blackpool, yeah. yeah. And then he got six for 60 against Leicestershire as well. David Gower was one of your wickets that day. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Back to Australia then. I guess we're coming to the end of your cricketing career. Back for 79-80. And you're back in the Australian squad, aren't you? Yeah, for the one-day comps, yeah, yeah. And, which was a real surprise. I thought it was all over and all done and dusted. And next thing you know, uh, I was actually about to walk on the ground for Western Australia to play against, I think, Tasmania. And I was stopped by an official and he said, don't walk onto the ground. 
you're on the next plane, you're playing for Australia at the MCG the next day against the West Indies. Yeah, and did you go well in those games? That very game, I went uh, the next day, we were playing the West Indies at the MCG, 78,000 people, and I took two for nine. I think a world economy record, yeah. I think it was. So that was, well, I don't know, would you, would you say that was your best performance in Australian share, or was it the, the Oval Test? The Oval Test was the most memorable. Mm. Uh, possibly um, the Gillette Cup when I played for Western Australia and got those runs, 47 runs, was very memorable for me. And the, the two for nine but was up there for sure. And you were very close to actually playing one more Test match, weren't you? Because you were 12th man against the West Indies for that third Test, I think, in Adelaide. Is that right? Correct. And I've, I've often thought about that. And it was a flat track against a powerful West Indies side. And I think I might have made a mess of my bowling average, which was yeah. very good. So uh, <laughs> it may have been a blessing that I, I didn't make the team. A good one to miss. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. We're nearing towards your retirement here from cricket. When did you decide to retire and how difficult a decision was that? Uh, not at all. I retired, I think, in 81. And yeah. I could tell that the edge had gone off me. Uh, you know, I wasn't quite as keen. And I certainly wasn't the same bowler that I was three or four years earlier and I thought no I'm, I'm not going to hang around and get dropped from the team and I, I do remember when I retired the head selector of West Australia a man called Alan Edwards who was a very prominent person in West Australia said I was always an automatic selection and never once have I been dropped from the team in my entire career yeah. and I thought that was a good way to go out. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you yeah. Graham. Mick Malone, ladies and gents, what a performance that was on his Ashes debut. Of all the one Ashes test wonders in the 20th century, only Pat Pocock in 1968 and Steve Watkin in 1993 can match Mick's six wickets in the match. But when you consider his 46 runs too, Mick's performance surely ranks highest. But he still comes a little way short of matching Fred Tate's exploits in his one and only Ashes test in 1890. Fred took 12 for 102, and just like Mick and Steve Watkin, his sparkling display came at the Oval. Thanks to Ted Wishart and Greg Chappell for their contributions to the show. I'll be adding some clips of Greg Chappell to the YouTube channel and Once Upon a Time in the Ashes.com very soon including his memories of a dolly of a drop catch off the bowling of Fred Rumsey during his time at Somerset. Until then, I've been Graham Barrett, and this has been Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. <laughs>